Helen, um, thank you very much. That's uh, a, a bit humbling, actually, to have to talk after that introduction. But I will, I will not be humbled, and I will go on. Um, those of us now who work on ancient Rome um, tend to find that we are in much public demand, but not always for the right reasons. I was reflecting the other day that the commonest question that journalists either ring me up or email me about is a very simple one, and it is, which Roman emperor is Donald Trump most like? <laughs> now, this always puts you in a difficult position. Um, uh, I have one of two responses. If I've got a lot of time and they're on the phone, I try to go through the arguments with them of why that's a really stupid question. Right? <laughs> I mean, even, I mean, you know, I, I hate Trump, but I mean, somehow the idea that he's anything like a Roman emperor is just so stupid. Um, if I've not got much time, th there's, a, there's a quicker response to this, which is to tell them the name of an emperor they've never heard of. <laughs> because then you know that they will have to Google it and they will learn something. And uh, the, the favourite, my favourite uh, one that I'm afraid I usually use is the third century emperor Elagabalus, you know, who you know, famously smothered his dinner guests in um, a shower of roses so generously that they suffocated, right? <laughs> and I, like, I always like to think of these guys, and they're usually guys, um, going back and thinking, Hello, now how do you spell that again? You know, and <laughs> getting it from Google. Now, uh, it is obviously a really stupid question, and it's a really lazy bit of journalism. These poor guys, they've got, you know, they've got a few column inches to fill, and they think, how should we do that in a faux-learned way? I know, you know, ring up Mary Beard, right? Um, and it, it is rivaled, I suppose, only by their other, sort of the second-ranking question uh, that people ask, which is, um, what does the fall of the Roman Empire have to teach us now? Right? And in Britain, and particularly in Brexit Britain, um, it tends to come in the form of, is it true that the Roman Empire fell because there were too many foreigners? <laughs> now, this is a longer question to answer and put right, but one tries. Right? But all that kind of uh, journalistic, albeit slightly silly, slightly lazy, interest in ancient Rome does, for me, raise the question about the role of Rome, not so much in academic study, I could talk about that for ages, but really the role of ancient Rome in a much more public definition of what history is uh, and a much wider definition of what contemporary debates Rome might contribute to, and I think it's quite important not to say is relevant to, but might be might contribute to. Now, now obviously, uh, that's that is the question I want to just to broach with you tonight. It's obviously hugely overgeneralizing, I, I and mean, I suppose it goes without saying that the role of ancient Rome in modern Rome. Uh, you know, when you have a columbarium in your garden, um, it feels different from the way uh, ancient Rome uh, is embedded in, say, the debates in the United States, you know, where there is still a Senate and where people in Washington, D.C. still have a topography which is determined by a particular vision of Rome, and it's different, again, from thinking about ancient Rome uh, in the United Kingdom. I mean, people in the UK, I think, uh, remain, you know, even at a very popular level, they remain confused about quite whose side they're on. You know, are we on the Roman side because the Romans kind of brought running water and lavatories and roads in a kind of Monty Python-esque way? Or are we real, always really rebels? You know, are we Boudicca and are we trying to, uh, to get rid of um, this occupying power? So it's, you know, I am, I'm touching corners 
um, there are all those kinds of differences. And I, I think also across Europe, across the West, across the world, really, um, there's not only those kind of different styles of engagement and different emotional, actually, engagements, as well as intellectual engagements with the ancient world, but there are different historical traditions to how people um, embrace or reject the model of Rome and the different social uses to which Rome, quite outside the academy, has always been put. Now, my younger colleagues at this point, I think, um, would want me to stress, and I will mention this because I think it's important, um, they want me to stress the toxic, it's a very horribly 21st century word, isn't it? The toxic effects of our engagement with Rome and the toxic purposes to which Rome, particularly within Europe, but not only within Europe, has been put. Um, we only need to think about, you know, the relatively recent past to the last, say, let's 150, 200 years to think of Rome somehow being used in a, in a wide culture to justify dictatorship, to justify empire, and to justify particular forms of social elitism. Um, you know, in this city, we've been uh, walking around a little bit this afternoon, and it, the connections forged by Mussolini with Augustus, you know, are in your face when when you walk out, uh, and. In Britain, and I think it's true to some extent of other European countries, but I think Britain is a particularly extreme example of it. You know, the idea that uh, the British social elite used knowledge of Latin as a social gatekeeper in order to keep <coughs> other people out um, is something that people who today work in universities are still struggling with. I mean, it's you know a sociologist's dream, isn't it? How do you create a social elite? Well, you make the poor little boys of this social elite learn two dead languages of no use to them in order to stop the plebs getting in, right? And you know, anybody who works at a university now uh, trying in the UK to teach and encourage people to come to learn um, to learn more at university level about the ancient world is still struggling with that image of exclusiveness um, and rather painful exclusiveness. I mean, they, they, these poor kids uh, were not taught Latin and Greek very well. So I think that you know, if you're looking at Rome in, in, the, in the world of general culture, um, I think that you have got, there, there is an inheritance which is um, in, not wholly, it doesn't feel comfortable. But it seems to me that that is only one side of the story. And that to stress the toxicity of, of the ancient world uh, and its influence on the modern world is actually to miss out some really much, much more important points about what engaging with, talking about, dialoguing with ancient Rome can bring to modern debates and to modern you know, culture outside the academy. Now, uh, I, I could talk here, I know there's some archaeologists in the audience, um, and I do apologise that I'm not talking here about new discoveries. You know, we could, um, we know that, that new discoveries about ancient Rome that come from the soil um, are appealing to large numbers of people. Um, that's true. That's not what I'm concerned with. I mean, I, I think the kind of the background to what I'm thinking of trying to argue here is to say, suppose we never knew anything more about ancient Rome than we know now. So let's forget about glamorous archaeology or less glamorous archaeology, um, uh, why would we still think, you know, what has ancient Rome got going for it? And it's got a lot more than whether Trump is like Nero or Elagabalus, I can tell you. Um, and I, I want to just group what I have to say into kind of three very rough headings. Um, surprise, uh, complexity and difference. 
and I want to, you know, to make an argument which kind of goes below um, some of the sillier ways in which Rome gets incorporated in um, media, social, and otherwise. I think in terms of surprise, um, what I think is really worth underlining here is the fact that there is such an enormous amount of material culture and literature surviving from the Roman Empire and before. Now, I think that academics are kind of frightfully kind of gloomy crowd. And you go to any academic conference about the Romans, and oh my God, they're always saying, oh, you know, we don't know anything about this. We have, perfectly true, we have no voices of women, or you know, nobody is telling us about, you know, Roman historians themselves are not interested in the economy. And you kind of come away with the impression that, you know, that our knowledge of ancient Rome our direct immediate knowledge is tiny. Now, the truth is, you know, you can bemoan what the Romans don't tell us about, but if you do that, you're probably asking the wrong questions. You know, you're never going to find out about the Roman uh, uh, macroeconomic climate, but there's lots of other things that you can. And I think in terms of taking Rome out into a, a wider audience, you know, it is extremely important to stress that there is more surviving Roman literature than anybody could master in a lifetime. Now, it's not like working on the 20th century. Sure, it's not. But there is an enormous amount of stuff that you could not hope to get through. And it's telling you more about some aspects not always the aspects we think we want to know about, but it's telling you more about some aspects of life in ancient Rome than you would possibly find again until you got, say, to the world of Renaissance Florence. You know, that, that this is a richly documented community in which it is fun to delve and which there is plenty of material for delving. So the point one really is surprise because people are surprised by that. But also, you know, I think it's a pity that academics can't quit being so kind of gloomy, kind of Eeyore-like about how little we know. We know loads about Rome. And more, you know, two, two and a half thousand years ago almost, um, sometimes we can tell the story of the city day by day. You know, that is something to be fascinated by and to interest people with. But that's a fairly uh, obvious point. I think that I'm also interested, really, in the way that Rome helps us, partly because of its distance, it helps us explore the notion of sophisticated complexity. Now, I find that at the moment very appealing because I think that one thing that social media does, you know, and I'm a great tweeter, but Twitter is a terrible, terrible um, culprit here, is, you know, social media reduces questions to simple binary opposition answers. You know, you're either for me, and so I like you, um, and I follow you, and I retweet you, or, you know, you're against me, in which case I'm going to pile in on you. And you know, I think, you know, particularly in the co kind of complexity, just you know, to go back to Britain for a moment, the kind of complexity that debates about Brexit have raised ha has been so woefully undermined by a determination of quite a lot of social media to deny that sense of complexity. And somehow, for me, ancient Rome becomes a beacon, and you can talk to people in this way. It becomes a beacon for enjoying things being complicated. Now, that comes in, in many ways, and I, but I think the, perhaps the most obvious way is in terms of imperialism. I mean, if you think of our, um, our standard caricature of the Romans <coughs> is that they're nasty, brutal, expansionist, military imperialists, right? And they are, you know? I mean, up to a point, that is true. You know, Caesar committed... You know, Caesar was not a great general. He committed genocide in Gaul, in our terms. Fine. 
But I think that one of the things that engages people when you start to talk about that is that actually Romans were one of the nastiest, brutalist, imperial cultures ever. They weren't any different from those ancient cultures we kind of think are nicer. The Athenians were just as horrible as the Romans, you know, in those terms. And, you know, massacred, you know, man for man, they massacred just as men. But I think it's what is really important for me is that what comes out of that culture are some of the most... Um, important, pointed, and strident critiques of empire that anybody has ever seen. Now, I don't just mean that I think it's quite interesting that when um, Scipio finally destroyed Carthage in the second century BC in a horrible, um, um, really uprooting and burning of the city, um, he was observed by his friend, the historian Polybius, um, looking at these uh, flames of the city of Carthage, and Scipio was crying. Uh, and Polybius, according to his account, turns to Scipio, a bit dim, actually, Polybius was at this point, unusually, and said, why are you crying, Scipio? Um, and Scipio quotes a bit of Homer. It's interesting that Scipio, this second century, butch Roman, appeals to Homer. Um, to the effect that that's going to happen to our city one day. Right? So you have built into this kind of sense of Roman imperialism a, a sense that it cannot possibly last, that empires cannot <coughs> last. But for me, the most important and most moving um, uh, critique ever of Roman Empire was one written by the historian Tacitus in the second century AD, um, you know, a, a man who climbed up the uh, Roman administrative ladder, uh, was the son-in-law of a governor of Britain, uh, and he writes the history of his father, of his father-in-law, and his partly his campaigns in Britain. And at one point, he puts words into the mouth of an opposing Britain, a Britain opposing the Romans. Um, and uh, this guy is made to say by Tacitus, and it's Tacitus's words, you know, what, you know, what does the Roman Empire amount to? And it's a very famous line. He says, what the Romans do is they make a desert and they call it peace. Now, at no point ever since has that description of empire ever been bettered, right? That, you know, we are still making deserts and calling it peace. And that was absolutely already formulated by these apparently brutish Romans. And I think people, in terms of thinking about complexity, 2,000 years ago, it's safe territory, but we can talk about those things. And people enjoy getting to grips with that kind of, that kind of way that things aren't ever as simple as they seem. And just occasionally, I'm pleased to say that um, you find that Rome offers very clear challenges, um, even to those who eagerly conscript it to their virtuous purposes, but with far too much simplicity. My favourite example of that is John F. Kennedy um, doing his famous speech in Berlin, the Ich bin ein Berliner speech. Um, what runs up to him saying, you know, I'm, I'm a Berliner, is he says, look, um, go back to ancient Rome, well, what was the proudest slogan of the ancient Romans. It was, Civis Romanus Sum, I am a Roman citizen. Uh, and that leads him on to this discussion of you know, how he too can be a Berliner. Uh, what I think Kennedy's speechwriters, because presumably he didn't write it himself, what Kennedy's speechwriters didn't know or realize or share with him was the fact that that was a Roman slogan. Um, and indeed, it was uh, his most famous use was um, it, in a discussion um, by Cicero of some of the terrible goings on in Sicily under a rapacious governor, Governor Verres. And at one point, he does repeat several times, Kiwis Romanus sum, Kiwis Romanus sum, I'm a Roman citizen. Who is saying it, you say to yourself? Who is making that? 
claim. Well, actually, it was a claim made utterly fruitlessly by a Roman citizen on Sicily who was being crucified by Verres. He had been turned on his cross to face the land of Italy, and Verres said, tough luck, mate. And this guy died shouting, Kiwis Romanus sum, Kiwis Romanus sum. I'm a Roman citizen. It made not a blind bit of difference. <laughs> now, in some ways, you know, there is a very complicated story there about how we might want to inflect um, Kennedy's enthusiastic um, use of this and its most famous ancient example. But just to, to finish, I, I want to finish with the idea of <coughs> kind of the difference of the Romans or uh, the that peculiar combination that you get in all kinds of other periods of history, the Romans are not unique here, um, that peculiar combination of um, our sense of similarity and difference simultaneously with Rome. And I think there is something about um, this distant culture which in a way turns us into, as it were, anthropologists of ourselves. That there is, it is a way of seeing ourselves um, from the outside. Now, in part, of course, the Romans are, they feel, they can feel very similar. That's partly because we have learnt some of our own ways of talking about problems we face from reading them or reading people who have read them. Right? Uh, and so, for example, um, you know, I think, I mean, it would be, it would be an impoverished reading of Dante not to know anything about Virgil's Aeneid. And I, I think if you look back uh, to some of the struggles of the fall of the Republic before the rise of Julius Caesar, uh, you find uh, our own debates about terrorism, uh, what homeland security means, and the liberty of the individual citizen, that have been formative debates really ever after. When, when Cicero again um, confronts the people who he believes, you know, he believes about as much as I think Tony Blair believed that there were people trying to undermine um, and to destroy the Republic of Rome. Um, and he puts those suspected criminals to death without trial. That sense of what right the state has to use summary execution or summary imprisonment or imprisonment beyond due process is one of the debates we still have. And they're debates that partly feel familiar to us because that's how we have learned to talk about them. But I think that in some ways even more important is that the Romans jolt us out of our self-satisfaction about our own kind of sense of appalling modernist self-righteousness that we have. I just want to give you two examples of that. You know, one is um, going around any place that you could go, and this is to come to archaeology, any place that you could go where there are apparently slave rooms. Um, I'm thinking here, for example, of Hadrian's Villa at Tivoli, but there's plenty. And you go around with a group of students, and you say, and you look at these rooms, and you know exactly what the students are going to say. They're going to say, oh, this is terrible. I mean, this is appalling slavery. And then you say to them, do you think we have people who are enslaved now? And first of all, they say, oh, no, no. <laughs> you know, we abolished slavery in whatever we did. And then you say, are you really sure? You know, are you really sure there aren't people who are living in conditions exactly like this, with as much freedom or lack of it as these people who lived here had? And suddenly they've switched. They suddenly say, gosh, you know, the, the perspective that you have, the place in which you stand, you know, you can seem totally self-confident about the social change that has happened over the last 200 years, but in the end it is written in nothing. But the most um, vivid example of this, um, I, I came across about, I suppose, 20 years ago when I was 
um, working with some media in the Colosseum. And if you work in the Colosseum with media, you have plenty of time when you do nothing and you're waiting for them to faff around, you know, getting the recording right and everything. So I went around the Colosseum listening to what the school parties were being told. And there were school parties from every nation in Europe. You know, there was plenty of Italians, French, German, Brits, and all the rest. And what was interesting was that the strategy of the teachers in the Colosseum was almost always identical. They would say, um, what was this place for? They would say to their class, and somebody, usually a boy, would put his hand up and say, oh, this is where the Romans killed, you know, people by the million, you know, whatever, gladiators. They just passed the fake gladiators on the way in. They all know what happened here. Um, and so they had a bit of, of um, uh, chat about that. And then the teacher would say, always, would we do that now? And they all said, no, miss. No, we wouldn't do that. And you just, the temptation to go over to those kids and say, what do you think happens to boxers, you know, when they retire? You know, what do you watch? What do you, you know, what do your parents watch in the movies? You know, do you think you don't watch people getting killed? Um, no, I was much too polite to do that. But it did seem to me that it was another great example of where you could, you can use this distant culture to, to puncture that kind of our self-righteous certainty that we're better than the past. And I suppose what I've just given you um, is a sort of version of my longer response to the journalists who want to know about which emperor uh, Donald Trump is most like. You know, you want to sit down and say, that's not why we study Rome. We study Rome in part to see ourselves from a different point of view. And that's why it's interesting, and you know, and stuff whether Trump is like Caligula or not. Thank you very much. <laughs>